Yeah, so um, hello guys, uh, I'm Rob Bishop. I'm one of the very few engineers involved with the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Uh, you might already have heard of us. We've had a lot of press coverage in the, in the last year, and we've sold a lot of hardware, actually, uh, which has been pretty cool. Um, I am going to talk a bit about the, 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 the past, about uh, where the, what the foundation, how it was founded, you know, what we're trying to achieve, um, why we created the, the product that we did. Um, you know, what we're doing with that right now, you know, what people are using it for, a little bit about our educational aims for the future, and then hopefully have lots of time for discussions. Um, you'll notice I'm not using a presentation. I'm very conscious that, you know, these days, if you, uh, if you want to go and find some facts and figures, you can probably do that on your smartphones as I'm talking. Uh, the real value of me being here is to actually talk to you guys, uh, hear, hear what you have to say, and, and, and discuss, uh, you know, what it is that, that we think needs to be done about uh, education. Um, I'm aware that you guys are... Uh, are probably uh, similar to us and that you're, you know it's very concerning looking at the way that IT is being taught in schools uh, looking at the fact that you can go all the way through uh, uh, you know school education without knowing what a computer is um, and you know that we're producing uh, not enough engineers uh, and of those engineers very few are then going into engineering disciplines and so what we're trying to do is inspire people back to, to doing that we're trying to give them the tools to go and do cool things and uh, and yeah we're, we're, we're trying to get people to be engineers again so the, the Raspberry Pi Foundation was started by uh, a bunch of academics over at the Cambridge Computer Laboratory. And uh, what they discovered was actually um, they were having fewer and fewer applicants for computer science at Cambridge over the years. And they're really worried about this. Uh, they, they, they went away and they thought, you know, why is it that we're getting fewer applicants? And not only were they getting uh, less number, but the actual the applicants they were getting had, had fewer skills. And that's really bad, because the problem is if we're getting fewer people applying for computer science, that means we're getting fewer graduates coming out, that's less people for the industry, it's bad for the economy, and it's bad for us as geeks, because we have less cool toys to play with. And um, they went away and tried to figure out why this was. <clears throat> and they realized that the problem is, is that uh, whereas uh, previous generation, generation I'm, I'm sure a lot of you guys grew up in, you know, of having readily accessible computers, having things like spectrums, where you, know, you had a command line, you know, if you wanted to use it, you had to go and do some programming. If you wanted to play a game, you'd go to the uh, news agents, you'd buy a magazine, you'd flick through the pages, look for a game which looked good, you'd type it in, you know, you'd compile it, and then you'd go and run it. As opposed to today, when we have these uh, very advanced but very closed systems, where, you know, you boot them up, you uh, browse on the interface what game you like, you download it, and never have to see anything about what's in it or what's, what's uh, you know, beyond the plastic. So my generation grew up with, with two kinds of computing advice. We grew up with the games console, and we grew up with the uh, kind of home Windows PC. Now, games consoles are phenomenally advanced with a kit. Uh, when you think an Xbox 360 has uh, more computing processing power in terms of flops than a, a 1990s Cray supercomputer, uh, there's a lot of performance there. The problem is, is that the games console manufacturers don't want you to know anything about it. You know, they don't want you to know about the silicon that's inside it. They don't want you to know about the engineering that was behind it. They just want to tell you about the marketing. They want to tell you about the games. You know, they want to hide that away from you. I mean, to the point where we saw uh, a hacker a few years ago called Geohot, who got Linux running on a PS3, and then got sued by, by the Sony Corporation for doing that. You know, it's, it's here's a device, but we only want you to consume with it. We don't want you to understand. The, the other device that we grew up with was the home Windows computer. Now, whereas a Windows computer uh, is, is perfectly capable for doing development, the problem is, is that uh, you know, we're, we're very much, um, we, want, we want the shortest route to success as a society. Right? And so the problem with the Windows computer is if you want to develop, you have to go away and spend time or money getting some development tools, you know, getting Sigwin or you know, God forbid, Visual Studio, or whatever it is you want to develop on. You have to um, go and make the effort to go and get those tools. Whereas, you know, you can open a browser and suddenly there's more hours of high definition video content than you could ever watch at your fingertips. And so the problem is, is that everything's geared towards, you know, no barrier to entry for content consumption, but a very high entry cost if you want to go and actually create something. And so what we realized is that we weren't going to be able to produce something as a, as a startup or as a charity that was going to replace a home computer. You know, we weren't going to be able to replace the games console. So what we needed to do was to produce something that was cheap enough and accessible enough that you could have an addition that was a toy purely for playing and was something purely for learning. You know, I remember uh, taking apart our home desktop computer when I was younger and my dad coming in and being really mad at me because he wanted to check his emails and I kind of got the motherboard on the floor wondering what it does. 
And, um, and it's really important that we don't have people who are scared of taking stuff apart. You know, we don't have a generation who are too scared to make things because they don't want to break it. You know, you learn a lot by reverse engineering. And so what we wanted to do was make something, as I say, was, was cheap enough that you know, parents could buy for their kids without even necessarily understanding what it was and not worry too much about what they were doing with it. You know, if they suddenly see them with a very hot soldering iron and a board in the corner, they're not thinking, you know, oh God, I can't believe how much that cost. They're thinking, well, you know, it's, it's 25 pounds, what's the worst that can happen? You know, that's less than the price of Call of Duty, basically. You know, for less than the price of a video game, you can buy a whole computer. And so what we wanted to do was have something that kids could own, that they could then go and experiment with, they could build things, they could, uh, they could learn by doing. Uh, we're very conscious that, you know, sort of uh, algorithmic uh, computational thinking and, and programming is very important. But actually, it's quite hard to get people excited about things like, you know, optimizing algorithms. Because, you know, people, we're very visual people. We like to see stuff. We like to interact with it. You know, it's, it's very hard to, to sit down with someone and say, you know, you should go and learn this Boolean arithmetic because it's very useful. It's a lot easier to show them, you know, a, uh, a lamp which is connected to Twitter so that when you tweet on, the lamp turns on. And people to go, hey, that's cool. I want that in my bedroom. And you go, right, well, if you want one of those, you're going to have to learn to code to do it. You know, and suddenly things have context and it has meaning. You know, and so we, we, we think physical computing, this, this idea of hacking, of making, is very important. Um, you know, I personally, uh, I love the, the, the maker culture. It's really uh, burgeoning at the moment. Um, there's lots of things called hacker spaces. Uh, if you guys as keen engineers don't know what a hacker space is or have never been to one, I'd massively encourage you to go to London Hackspace. Uh, just turn up when they're having an open, open night. And it, it's basically this kind of engineer's playground where they have loads of tools and loads of gear and people are making stuff. Not because you know, they've got a brilliant uh, startup idea and they want to go sell it to VCs. Uh, you know, not because they want to go and get international celebrity, but because, hey, it's cool to make things. And you know, it doesn't have to have a point or a reason. You know, it, it's something that's fun to go and do. So I'd massively encourage you to, to, to go to those. I've, I did a tour of Hackspaces in the US, and you meet some absolutely brilliant people. You know, the kind of people who literally just you know, sit in their bedrooms and make cool stuff just because you know, they, they feel like it. Um, uh, and they're always really interesting as well. So as I say, so the foundation had this idea that we wanted to make this, this cheap, open computing platform. So the other thing, which is, uh, I mentioned the, the uh, importance of cheap. The other important thing is open. You know, you can only really understand something if actually you publish how it works. Uh, you know, it's very important that we had something that was open enough that people could go and play with the software, people could get the schematics, that they could build into other stuff. Uh, and we felt that was an important thing. And so the, the foundation, led by Evan Upton, uh, who, who came up with this idea of having this cheap open uh, computing device, uh, they, they thought for a, a number of years on how to do this. And they couldn't find a solution that was, was cheap enough uh, or accessible enough in order to uh, fulfill their needs. Evan then went on to work at Broadcom, uh, where he uh, helped, where well, he's the architect of a, a graphics architecture that was a, a co processor designed to go in smartphones to handle the, the, the GPU graphics requirements. This then uh, became a, an applications processor, basically a, a system on chip that combined a GPU and an ARM processor. Uh, and suddenly, Eben saw this uh, very large, very expensive development platform we had, which we gave to the software engineers to go and uh, you know, write their apps to run on our app, uh, our, the Broadcom processor. And he thought about this very cheap computer he wanted to make. And he realized, actually, the thing he'd been envisaging was basically a very cut down version of this, uh, this platform. And so I was, I was lucky enough to be an intern for him at the time. And uh, one of the great things about doing engineering is that if you're an intern in, in law or something, you end up uh, photocopying or making uh, coffee. Uh, as an intern in engineering, you actually get to do all the best jobs because you get to do the stuff that you know, uh, management says, well, we want to do this, but it's not going to make any money. So let the interns do it, um, which tends to be the most interesting stuff. So I, I got to go and, uh, and do some of the uh, original hardware and, and, and software design for the early prototypes for this, uh, which some of you might have seen uh, way back when uh, David Braben went on uh, uh, BBC with a kind of a USB stick uh, with a camera on it, which he, he pronounced we were going to make this, this computer um, that you could plug into your plug a keyboard and mouse in and plug into your TV, and it was going to be uh, $25. And um, that was a, a real turning point. Because up till then, we'd seen this as an educational tool. You know, we thought we'd probably sell you know, maybe 10,000 in a year. That was what we were aiming for. Um, and the idea was you know, we'd sell them, into, you know, sell them into schools, we'd sell them to academic institutions. It'd be a, a way to teach people. 
And then suddenly, the, you know, the press gets out that we're going to produce this, this $25 computer. And all the people like me who are sat at university going, hey, I really want to go build a robot. You know, but actually, I need some money for beer. So I can't afford to go and spend hundreds of dollars on buying all the parts I need to go and do this. Uh, you know, all the people, uh, my generation, we had robot wars. Robot wars was a very frustrating thing as an engineer, right? Because you'd watch this program, and there'd be all these awesome robots fighting each other. And you'd go, I really want to build one of those. But basically, you know, you didn't have the tools. I couldn't weld. <laughs> I couldn't go and spend I have thousands of pounds to go and spend on making a robot for robot wars. But suddenly, when we announced that actually you could have you know, the brains that was 90% of what you needed for that robot for $25, suddenly there was a lot of people who went, hang on, I can see a use for that. So actually, it ended up when we uh, put our pre-orders page up, we got over 100,000 orders in pre-orders, you know, when we thought we'd get 10,000. Uh, we've, we've just found out that uh, we, we started trading last February, uh, uh, selling uh, online or worldwide uh, through our partners, RS and Farnell. Um, we just found out that Farnell have shipped um, half a million uh, Raspberry Pi Model Bs up till now, uh, which we, we don't have the exact figure for RS yet, but basically our estimates is that we've probably sold uh, a million units in a year, which is, that's, that's kind of cool, right? Um, you know, we're, we're quite proud of that. So, so what is the, uh, the Raspberry Pi? So how many people here have a Raspberry Pi? Yeah, as I say, I, I always forget to talk about what the Raspberry Pi is because by this point, most people have probably, they've either got one or they saw there was a lecture about a Raspberry Pi and thought, I've no understanding of what that's about, Googled it, and then suddenly discovered. But uh, essentially, uh, the recap is, you know, it is a very cheap Unix box. It's essentially a smartphone without the baseband and radio. You know, it's a system that you can plug in with HDMI to your TV, just the same way as you would do an Xbox or games console. You can plug into, you know, the internet via networking, plug in a keyboard and mouse via USB. Uh, all the storage is done via SD card, mobile phone charger, boot it up, and it's an open Linux system. You know, the magic of this, as I say, is you know, it's, it's all of these pins here. It's the fact that you've got I squared C, you've got SPY, you've got um, a whole bunch of GPIO. You know, suddenly you've got uh, you've got an embedded microcontroller that you can write Python scripts to control. You know, you've got a system that you can do everything from learning Scratch, which I don't know if people are familiar with MIT Scratch. It's like a uh, visual programming language um, that sort of teaches uh, sort of computational thinking and algorithmic development, but without ever saying those kind of scary words, you know, sort of drag and drop things to make cats move around the screen. And you can do everything from that all the way through to writing your own operating system in ARM assembly language, you know, via the JTAG access. And so suddenly you have a very cheap system that, you know, you literally can learn everything from never having touched a computer before to being a kernel developer. And, you know, you can use in everything from a, a system you might send into space through to something you might have on your door to make an alarm sound when someone walks in your room. Um, and and that's, that's a really powerful thing. Um, this is the Model B. It's, uh, it's, it's 30 pounds, uh, $35. Um, it's on sale right now. Uh, initially, there was lots of stock issues. Uh, we, a lot of people come up to me and say, oh, can we buy stock now? You can now buy stock. As I say, uh, initially, um, you know, we expect to sell 10,000 of these. So uh, when we sold 100,000 pre-orders, uh, you know, trying to get the demand, uh, develop en enough stock for the demand was, was epic. Um, and so, you know, it's only now that we're getting to the point where actually we have a, uh, a steady supply. We've currently um, got in manufacture uh, a Model A. So this is the this is Model B, it's a Model A. You'll see they look very similar. Uh, the difference is basically this has a, a USB, a networking hub chip, and this one doesn't. So this one has a single USB port, no wired networking, and no hub chip. Now, one of the really interesting things is actually, um, as a testament to uh, mobile processor power consumption, it's actually the, the networking consumes 50% of the power consumption on the Model B. So by removing the networking from the Model A, you can actually run this uh, underclocked on 100 milliamps at uh, 5 volts. So it's half a watt for an entire Linux distribution. You know, if, if you think what you can do with a Linux distribution, you can run on half a watt with a bunch of GPIO, that's quite a lot of things. Um, and so it's cheaper, it's 25 pounds. You know, it's got all you need. If you have a, a USB hub, you know, it's, it's designed for education, it's designed to be cheap. But also, you know, there'll be a lot of embedded uh, software engineers in here who are thinking that's a pretty cool embedded platform. Um, as I say, that's being manufactured right now. Uh, it's gonna go on sale soon, basically as soon as we can. Um, I'm always pressed for, for dates, but basically the answer is as soon as we can. 
Uh, that's basically our, our strategy. Um, we also have a camera board coming out soon. Uh, and that's going to basically, as I said, this is basically a, a smartphone without the radio or baseband. So the, uh, all we've done is we've got a, a CSI and a DSI port on here to the GPU. And that's going to allow you to add a 5 megapixel camera sensor just the same way as you would do on your smartphone. Um, and that's going to allow you to uh, offload uh, video capture and JPEG capture onto the GPU, which means that suddenly you'll be able to do a lot of uh, probably OpenCV projects. Uh, you'll be able to do um, various things with image capture. You know, for example, you could have a, a networked uh, security system. You know, you could have a high definition uh, 1080p 30 frames a second feed. Uh, you know, running over a network from Raspberry, one Raspberry Pi to another, where you've got a display, or you can you know, set your Raspberry Pi as a web server and have people you know come and access it. It was great around Christmas. I don't know how many people follow our blog. Uh, a lot of people set up webcams with Raspberry Pi controlled lights. Uh, there was one IT company which I think they thought was a good idea at the time. Um, set up a webcam uh, with all of their like inflatable reindeer and, and lamps and Christmas lights all around the office controlled by Raspberry Pi so that people could go on the website and change the various lights which basically meant that they spent the entirety of December in a room with constantly flashing garish lights controlled by other people. Which I'm, I'd be really, in, I mean, they were keen at the start of that project. I haven't heard from them since. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you know, you can go and do this great stuff. So I, I as I say, I mean, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of you'll have Raspberry Pis, a lot of the, the resources and things you, know, you can find online. Uh, I think a lot of the value of me being here is a chance to, to discuss things and talk to you guys. Um, as I say, you know, the, the future bit is, is the education. So um, we've got next month uh, Director for Education coming on board, uh, who, who uh, is, is currently a teacher, who's, who's going to help us uh, target this uh, better for schools. We're going to have an educational software release. We're, gonna, uh, we're working with other organizations to produce lesson plans and resources. Um, you know, uh, one of the things people ask is, okay, you've sold a lot of boards, but how many of those are going to, to education, to your goal yet? And the answer is, right now, uh, we think about 25% of those have gone straight into education. A lot of those have sort of tangentially gone into education, you know, been bought by parents who are teaching their kids or, you know, running code clubs or various other schemes. Um, but we haven't directly pushed into schools yet. And that's because you know, the, the worst thing that could happen is that we find you know, rows of these on a shelf because teachers have bought them but don't know how to, to use them. Um, and so what we're making sure is that there is the resources and the materials and the backing such that we can you know, provide a package for schools to say, you know, we think IT should be more than just teaching uh, Microsoft Office products. You know, we think we should be teaching a bit of Python, a bit of Scratch, you know, uh, teaching uh, about, about Linux. And uh, you know, here's a $35 bit of hardware you can do it on, and here's a bunch of lesson plans and resources. And that's, that's the end goal. Uh, 